All right, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? So, um, you know, this season, one of the things that it, it does in, in my life is it reminds me of just how much of a blessing children and family really are and how much God has blessed us with children and family. I oftentimes, um, just throughout the year, I spend time away from my kids and my wife periodically uh, for different reasons throughout the year. Maybe you travel for work or something like that and you can relate, but I, 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 will, I will travel for work or I'll be gone at a conference or something like that and um, or I'll just go get away with just me and my wife or something, and, or I'll be the one who's at home while my kids go visit grandparents uh, and aunts and uncles and all that kind of thing. And, and, so I, and what I've realized over nine years of being a dad and uh, 13 years of being married to my wife is I don't really like that a whole lot. Like There's just, there's just something about that I'm not a huge fan of. I, I, um, I know that... Um, like, don't get me wrong, like, I, I really love, especially when I can get alone with my wife and we can just go away and be together, and, and I always make that a priority, but there's something about when you've been gone away from your family for a couple of days where you're just longing to be back with them, and, uh, and you know, Mallory and I recently, we went to Utah back in October for four days, which was awesome, just the two of us spent time just experiencing something new that we had never really seen before um, in, in Utah, and, and just, just building into our relationship and those kinds of things and it was fantastic uh and and we flew home and we got home at like one in the morning and and we we uh we drove back to the house and got in bed about two and we were like up at 6 a.m like kids on christmas because we hadn't seen our kids in four days and we were ready to give them hugs and give them kisses and just let them know how much we love them i just cannot imagine what life would be like without my family without my wife and my kids i can't imagine what that would would be and and it's seasons like this that remind me um, just how much I love them, right? Because as much as I love them, I complain about how difficult they make life sometimes, right? I don't know if you share in that at all, but like I do. And, and it's, the, it's seasons like this that just remind me, man, the blessings far outweigh the struggles. They far outweigh the curses. And so as we continue to look at things in our church that we are going to value above all else... Um, you know, these are, these are this is our Christmas list, essentially, the, the list of priorities that we have said, we will not compromise on this. This is what we are going to be about. We aren't going to shift or change, but these things are going to kind of be our true north as a church community. Uh, and, we, and we did this around Christmas because it, 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 like we all understand making Christmas lists, right? You've all made Christmas lists. We talked about the first week. We talked about uh, how you have a list of Christmas movies that you are going to prioritize during the holiday season, and you're going to watch them. Have any of you guys watched all of them yet? No? So you've got to cram it in. You've got a week, all right? You've got one week. You've got to cram them all in this week. Every night, you're watching a Christmas movie. Uh, I, I, I'm a great husband. I just want to let you guys know. And I've been watching Lifetime Christmas movies with my wife now for the last two weeks. And I'll tell you, gentlemen, if you're not doing it, you're missing out. All right? It's a really, really joyous time to sit there and watch a Lifetime Christmas movie with your wife. So, uh, so you should do that, too. Uh, but, but we make these lists. Uh, like last week, we talked about making a list of your favorite Christmas treats. Uh, and then somebody brought me my favorite Christmas treat today. I'm so excited. Oreo truffles, everybody. I'm going to go home and eat those. Um, so excited. Uh, but, but, then, but then today, I want to just know, like, what's on your list of favorite Christmas songs? Because that's really, you know, that's a big deal. Right? We start playing this music. I had a professor in college who played Christmas music all year round. You go in his office and it was just Christmas music. I was like, dude, you're crazy. All right? Like, we can, we can start at Thanksgiving. All right? But we'll not any earlier. Uh, what are your favorite Christmas songs? All is well, all right. Silent night. That was in the first service too. Yeah, good. What else? Have yourself a merry little Christmas. What? Mary, did you know? Yeah. Oh, holy night. Yes, man. So good. A lot of those are are obviously uh, about Jesus, and that's beautiful, and that's great. One of my favorite Christmas songs is not about Jesus. It's uh, it's 
This Christmas by Donny Hathaway. It's an amazing Christmas song. I don't know if you guys like music, but if you like music, that song is incredible. All right? Uh, and so uh, I love uh, that, that Christmas song. It makes the top of my list of what I'm going to... Like, when I start listening to that, I know it's Christmas time. Uh, so maybe you have a similar feeling. But like, like those lists and like a lot of lists, uh, those are the things we're prioritizing in our life during Christmas. And, and we made a list as a church of things we're going to prioritize as a church. And our list is pretty short. Uh, it's formation, hospitality, and family. So formation, if you want to think about it in this way, is our idea of how we disciple people and how we help people become uh, students of Jesus. And then in hospitality is our way of evangelism, of welcoming people into the family of God and helping people make a decision to follow Jesus. And, and then family is just a, a huge part of our church and what we will value. And so today, that's what we're talking about. Today, we're talking about family and specifically why family matters to God. And why family matters to our church, but also why no matter what family background you come from, no matter whether you're single, married, divorced, have children, or don't have children, why family is a huge, huge part of each of our lives and makes a huge impact in our life. And so the first, let's look at why it matters so much to God, all right? So that's where we're going to start. Why does this matter so much to God? Well, you, to, to understand this, you just have to open up to the first page of the Bible, all right? Genesis chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, you can open it there. Open the first page, go to Genesis chapter 1, and you're going to find there in, in verse 27 where God uh, says this, or the Bible says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. All right. So what you get here is you get God creates man and woman and he tells them to be fruitful and multiply, create and build a family and then fill the earth and rule over it. And then he says, now, there are, there are two important things that like, I think are really important about these verses that, that stand out to me, okay? So I don't know what stands out to you when you read that, but this is what stands out to me. One is that this happens but while the world is still perfect. So God creates man and woman and tells them to create family while the world is still perfect, meaning that this is a part of God's perfect design for the world. Okay? It is very good, is what he says. All right? So, so he, it, it, before there is any sort of, of, of sin or fall, he says family is very good. The second thing that I see is, is that family is commanded by God. And then, not only that, but it's their job to build societies and cultures. Okay? This is called the cultural mandate of Scripture. And the job of the family... It's to build society. It's to build culture. In essence, God's perfect design for our world is, is centered around families being the driving force of creating society and culture. That society and culture is built on the back of family. But Satan hates this. Like Satan hates this idea. And he hates that God has said that this is very good. He hates that God has given rule and dominion to families and to humanity. And that God sees them as his prized possession. You know, we're in Genesis chapter 1. Now, if you flip all the way to the back of your Bible in Revelation chapter 12, you'll see how much the enemy hates this idea. It says, therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had been given birth to a male child. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against her and the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. Now, what you see, if you're looking at this, is you see that, that when Satan couldn't have his way in heaven, he's hurled to the earth, that he makes his dwelling here. He's called the ruler of the world in the scriptures. He is 
And he is going after women and children and families. And I know this might seem like, wow, Derek, this is like a really weird spiritual warfare kind of thing around Christmas. Couldn't we just talk about sweet baby Jesus? Yeah, we could. But um, but what what I'm trying to help us understand is that what God what God has designed is like the mission of Satan to destroy. That God designed this beautiful picture of what family is and what family can do and how family can change the world. And our enemy hates that and he's trying to destroy that. And so, and that's kind of, if you keep reading in Genesis, that's what happens. He comes in in chapter 3 and he invades marriage, husband and wife. In chapter 4, we see a brother kill another brother. Just two chapters removed and three chapters removed. It's like the family structure is just being ripped apart by the enemy. He hates this idea. And unfortunately, our world doesn't really value God's idea of family either. Like we have been and made determinations as a as a as a world and as a culture of what defines marriage and what doesn't. We don't look at what God says is marriage, but we look at what you know the world calls marriage. More marriages now than ever before are ending in divorce. More children and parents than ever before have fractured relationships and don't have great communication. More than ever before, parents are letting other people, leaders, technology, and friends take up the responsibility of forming their children. The image of dads in media, I don't know if you've caught on to this, are, are, are men who are disengaged, overworked, or just stupid. Now, you ever watch a sitcom? A sitcom is just making fun of how dumb dads are. Like, that's what a sitcom is, like, the whole time. Doesn't mean it's not funny, it's just sad. But people dismiss the value of family in our world. They dismiss it, they don't understand it, and they're giving up meaningful connection with people in their own bloodline to try and have meaningful connection with people on the internet. And in virtual realities, it's really not what God designed at all. And I would say that in that light, man, Satan has really accomplished a lot of what he wants to accomplish. He has really divided and broken families apart. And all I'm here to say is that our church is going to fight as hard as we can to make sure that the families that come here are families of God's design. They're their families where the father leads and is the head of the home, where the wife is, is right alongside of her husband, offering supportive help, building a dynamic house of where, where there is compassion and joy and peace and love and grace, where both mom and dad value the idea of, of the way of Jesus and becoming more like Jesus, where children honor their father and mother, but not only honor them, but love them because they're family and because their mom and dad love them and sacrifice for them constantly. We are going to do everything we can as a church to fight against the powers of spiritual darkness in our world to help people gain a hope of family and the power that it has if, if done in God's design. Because we know that the forces that are trying to rip families apart, your family and my family, are strong. We have to fight back. But also, family doesn't just matter because it's a part of God's beautiful design. That's primary. But it matters because it's also the mission field that we've been sat in the midst of, you know, for lack of a better term. You know, in Matthew chapter 28, we get this uh, thing called the Great Commission. And we all, if you grow up in church, you've heard the Great Commission. It's, you know, Jesus' call to go make disciples. It says this, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20... It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I command you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, a couple of things that I observe when I read this is first and foremost, there is a how you are supposed to make disciples. Okay. 
And, and, and that how involves a few different things. But one of the things that it involves is, is baptism. The word disciples is just a, a fancy word for student or apprentice. And so the way that someone would become a disciple of a teacher or a rabbi was to be baptized into that teacher's name. Essentially adopting that teacher's teaching as their methodology or what they were going to commit their life to live out. Does that make sense to everybody? So Moses had disciples. He baptized people into the name of Moses. John the Baptist baptized people in the name of John the Baptist. Jesus is now saying, baptize in my name and teach them to obey me. So in essence, baptism is the first step by which and the means by which someone commits their life to following Jesus. It very, like We can talk about what baptism is and what it isn't and how it works and how... At the very bare minimum, in, in what it was intended to mean, is it is a decision someone makes to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. And when someone says, I want to follow Jesus, they are saying, I want to be baptized into the name of Jesus. And so when someone is baptized in the name of Jesus, they are now a disciple. They are now a follower of Jesus. And now it's our job, once they've been baptized, to teach them how to walk with Jesus and follow his teaching. So this is one way in which it, it, it's, it's kind of systematic in how you make disciples. But then there's a less systematic thing that's talked about here as well, where Jesus says, go. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, what we tend to think as, as 21st century Americans when we read that is we need to go to other nations. Like, that's what we think. We think, oh, so this is a call that I need to go overseas and do foreign missions. And that's not bad if that's what God really truly has called you to. But I think what, what Jesus is really getting at and what I think the, if, you, if you parse this out, what the, what the Greek is really trying to say is as you are going, make disciples. And I want you to go into all nations, yes, that at some point you're going to be in all nations, yes, but as you're going, make disciples. And so, to be honest, what this means is that in your ordinary everyday life, you should be making disciples. Like as you live your life and you live in the place where God has you, make disciples. In the community that you're in. In the workplace that you find yourself where you spend most of your days. At soccer games with your kids and other families. And at PTA meetings. Make disciples. That's what Jesus is getting at. And for us, God has put us in Holly Springs. And according to recent census data, this Holly Springs population is primarily people from the ages 25 to 45 and 0 to 18. That makes up the majority of Holly Springs. Meaning we have a lot of moms, and we have a lot of dads, and we have a lot of kids. And if you look at our church, you see that. You see a lot of moms, a lot of dads, and a lot of kids, which is awesome. That means that we are reaching our community as we're supposed to reach our community. That's our hope. 33% of our church is kids, 33% of our church is parents, and 33% of our church are people who want to have kids or who have had kids, okay? So that's, that's where we're at. And so, so we understand this idea that this is where we've been placed. Holly Springs has the largest ratio child to adult in the entire state of North Carolina. This is our mission field. And as we are going, we are called to make disciples. If we are doing what God has called us to do, we will see ourselves making disciples of families. We will be reaching families. And so that's why when we as a church, we plan events, we plan events that are events for families. They're men's events, or they're women's events, or they're children's events. Because this is where God has us. We're trying to reach and cultivate the harvest that he has put us in. We want to love on and, and help families live according to God's design. So why we do things like the Blessify Giving Tree, so we can bless families. This is why we do things like have a preschool here on Monday through Friday, because we want to bless families 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 
This is a huge part of what we want to see happen. We want to be a place that encourages the blessing of families and the building of families according to God's design. But it's not just our mission field that we're called to harvest. It also is a huge part of each and every one of our lives. Which is why I said it doesn't matter what your feeling toward family is or what family you come from. Family matters to you. Or at least it should. I want to help you understand this by looking at something from Exodus chapter 34. All right. So this is where we're going to be the rest of our time. It says in Exodus chapter 34 verse 5 through 7. It says, Then the Lord came down in a cloud... And he stood there with him. So God comes down in a cloud. He's standing with Moses and he proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation that's family now let me break this down because this is kind of a weird thing um that that we might not be studying very often right that that's found in exodus but what you see is you see god come down in a cloud and he begins to speak to moses and he's declaring his name which in the scriptures is yahweh all right so he says yahweh yahweh and then he just talks about how great he is <laughs> which is pretty awesome because god is pretty great all right so he just talks about all his good qualities and all of the great things uh, about him and he talks about how it goes down to thousands now this is thought of as not just thousands of people and the way that like you would write in this time um during like ancient hebrew literature thousands was a way of saying everyone but it was also a way of saying for all time so not just thousands meaning everyone but thousands meaning forever all thousands of generations so from one generation to the next, God's love is unfailing. His forgiveness is unfailing. That he forgives wickedness and sin and rebellion unfailing to all people for all time. Praise God, right? But then it says he punishes us. And I don't know if you are reading what I'm reading, but when I read that, I'm like, what's up with that, bro? Like one minute you're like, you, you love us and you forgive us and you're offering kindness and grace and love. And then in the next verse, it's like, but I punish you. That's pretty whack. That's right. I'm bringing whack back. <laughs> I went back to 1999 this week and I was like, you know what? We need to reintroduce the world to whack. Like this, this is a problem in our society that we haven't used this terminology in a while. <laughs> so, yeah. 1999, you can have whack. All right. Um, <laughs> But anyway, we're, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm like, I'm like, man, what is, what is this? And like, even if I'm okay with like the punishment, right? Why am I being punished for other people's wrongdoing? Why am I being punished for things I didn't do, sins I didn't commit? You know, and I think what, what ultimately is overlooked here is that. It says punished in, in our translation. I think in the Hebrew, it's probably closer to consequences from everything that I can like deduct. That this terminology that is being written here is closer to consequences, which seems to make sense to me. Like Just to be honest, it seems to make a lot more sense to me because I can understand and even be okay with that a little bit more than punishment. God's saying that he loves us and he forgives us, but he's, but he's just simply saying that when something happens or you do something wrong, there are consequences to that. Unavoidable consequences. It doesn't mean I don't love you. It doesn't mean I don't forgive you. It doesn't mean that you like, aren't in my good grace. It just means there are consequences to the mistakes that you make. Can we all be okay with that? I think we can because we deserve a lot more than that, don't we? Like We really do deserve punishment. We deserve to die for our sin. And go to hell for our sin. And yet what Jesus does in the gospel. He comes and he dies on a cross. He lets his body be broken. His blood be shed. In order that that. Like, all we get is consequences. And he takes the punishment. That's the gospel. That's what we celebrate. 
That's what's so exciting. And so, man, if consequences are all I get, then praise God. Because I deserve a lot worse. But the, but the reality is, is that these aren't just my consequences and consequences that come from me and the way I live my life. But these are consequences that come from my parents, and my grandparents, and my great-grandparents. To the third and fourth generation. So, their sin is going to impact my life in a major way. Unless it's dealt with. Unless those consequences are wrestled with. Unless those sins are tried, like, intently and, and intentionally trying to be pushed back against and eradicated. You know, Pete Scazzaro, writer of Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, and The Emotionally Healthy Leader, he writes that you must go backward to go forward. Meaning that if you want to move forward in your family and not leave generational curses that continue to move throughout your family, from your children and to your grandchildren and to their children, then you have to go backward into your family of origin to see the things that have shaped you and formed you into the person that you are, the, the mistakes that have been made that have, have brought certain things upon you so that you can deal with those things and move forward with your family. And it doesn't mean when you find those things that your family didn't love you. It doesn't mean that they didn't work hard or try hard to give you the best life they could. It just means that like you and I probably right now, they probably just weren't super intentional about their formation or how they were forming you. I talked about this idea of formation a couple weeks ago, and I used this funny illustration of Mallory and I and how we were formed to clean the kitchen differently. Anyone else feel that in your house? Right? That, like, you can tell that you've been formed differently than this person because you're living with them. Uh, and, and so, like, I don't, it's not just, but, but it's just, it's not just those things, right? Like, uh, Mallory, she consistently says, Derek, uh, you don't know how to clean. You know how to stuff. Like, that's what she says. You know how to stuff things places and make it look like it's clean. But, like, yeah, open the closet, all right? Just open the closet, y'all. Um, and, and, then, and then I always say, well, you think that you know what organization is, but I just think you like being a tyrant. Uh, and so, like, it's, it's one of those things. Like, we, we have a healthy love for one another. But... Um, but it's just one of, those, it's one of those things where you begin to see how differently you were shaped and how you were taught and how you were formed. Um, but it's not just in the ways in which you think about taking care of housework. It's also in the ways in which you deal with conflict and the ways you deal with shame and pain and guilt and greed and money and parenting and everything. You have been formed by your parents and if your parents are like my parents and like Mallory's parents, they send a lot. So you probably are dealing with some stuff. And that's okay. But we need, to, we need to grab a hold of this and we need to understand this and we need to begin to work through some of these things. For some of us, that's going to mean that we have to go through into deeper measures of counseling and things like that to get to the bottom of it. For some of us, we can pretty well identify, yeah, my dad was an angry dude. That's why I'm an angry guy. But we have to begin to deal with these learned behaviors. We have to go backwards so we can go forward. You know, if what God says to Moses here is true, and it most certainly is true because it's the Bible, it means... That whether you have kids or not, that you are dealing with the result of your, of your family. Like you are living and dealing with regular results and consequences from your family. The result of the family that you were born into or that you were adopted into or that you were raised by. And it might be the reason why your first marriage failed. Or maybe your second and third as well. And it might be why... When, you know, something bad happens, you just blow up and explode and get angry at the smallest little thing. And it might be why you shut down and retreat and harbor deep resentment and can never really forgive. More than likely, no matter how old or how young, no matter what family you grew up in, the saying is true, you're a product of your raising. And as I like to say it, or prefer to say it, you are formed by who you're formed by. 
by the people who have influence in your life, predominantly your family, and you're dealing with those consequences that they dealt with and that they didn't mean to pass down to you, but they did, right? And you, these, these consequences, they didn't start with you, but they can't end with you. That's what I'm trying to help you understand. The consequences that you're dealing with, if you will go backward to go forward, you can unpack them and they can end with you so they don't become the legacy of the next generations to come. You know, I want you to think about it this way. You are going to leave a legacy one way or the other. You're going to leave a legacy on this earth. And the question is, do you want to leave a legacy of blessing or do you want to leave a legacy of consequence? I want to leave a legacy of blessing. Now, I'm probably going to, without wanting to, leave some consequences behind as well. But as much as I can possibly help it, I want to leave a legacy of blessing. I want to try and deal with these things so that they don't become issues for my children and their children. You know, so here's what I want to challenge you to. Um, I want to challenge you to build out a geneogram. All right? Now, you may have never seen one of these or know what this is, but basically this is where you go back into your family and you kind of investigate the people in your family and you begin to understand who they were, what kind of people they were, the things they dealt with, the things they struggled with, things they were good at, the things they weren't good at, right? And so this is like an example of a geneogram that could go back to your great-grandparents. That's three generations, all right? So you can go to your great-grandparents, and then you can see that, oh, you have grandparents, and then after your grandparents, you have your parents, and then you have you and your siblings. That's one side of your family if you're married, just so you know. So if you get your wife involved in this, and there's any divorce involved in this or anything else like that, you're going to need about 72 screens to get this done, all right? Uh, so uh, the, the idea is if, if, you, if you just go and you sit down, you begin to ask questions about, hey, what was, what was, how, how did great-granddad handle conflict? How did, you know, how did grandpa deal with money? What was life like growing up in your house? If you begin to ask these questions of your family and your, your parents and your grandparents and you begin to learn more about your family than you ever did before and you might even begin to learn more about yourself than you ever did before. Like, before there was clinical depression, were my grandparents depressed? Right? You can begin to kind of deal with some of this stuff in a way that hopefully allows you to, to move toward being a blessing. Because that's what family was meant to be. Look at Psalm 128. So what God says about family. He says, blessed are all those who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessing and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. You know, you may wonder, well, how do I ensure that I leave a legacy of blessing and not consequence? Well, it's right here. Blessed are those who walk in obedience to God. Who walk to follow God. And what is your blessing? It's your family. As you follow God, your family becomes a blessing. Your wife and your husband, your children, they become a blessing. And if you keep reading in 128, it, it, it talks about how your grandchildren become a blessing. That's why Mallory and I had four kids. is because we want to have 76 grandchildren. Like that's our goal. We just, we want, we want to see blessing throughout our family. And I just want to encourage you that it's never too late to deal with the stuff. It might not be fun. It might be hard. It might be difficult. But if you'll deal with it, if you'll wrestle with it, if you'll go backwards and go forward, man, could you leave a legacy of blessing in your family. You know, I find, it, I find it really interesting that God's perfect plan for dominion over the earth was to create families. Like that his design was to, to put families at the forefront of building culture and society. And 
I find it, and I'm really excited that, honestly, that my family gets to raise, or I get to raise my family along with you and your family, and my kids get to be here with your kids and all of those kinds of things. It really, I, I, I pinch myself sometimes just thinking of all the great friends that we have, and Garrett was talking about last week how, you know, I'm the guy, by the way, who invites 72 people to lunch, uh, and so we end up with like six, like we just have the whole restaurant. We didn't, we didn't reserve it. We just showed up and said, hey, we want the whole place. Um, and so it's like, it's like all of our families get together, and there's 47 people there, and uh, it's just, it's just, I love the fact that I get to do that and this is the environment the the community that we live in and i love and i'm amazed at the fact that as many screw-ups that came before me and my family and as royally screwed up as i am myself that like god is still offering forgiveness and grace thousands of generations later like it just continues to offer this and it just keeps coming down i'm amazed at how often i fall victim though to the improper formation of my family and i have a great family and maybe you do too but a lot of the problems that I have and a lot of issues I have stem from that formation that I was given. And now it's not just infecting me, but it's affecting my kids. And I can see that. My kids are the brunt of it. I have to deal with that in order to go forward. But the most fascinating thing of all, the most surprising thing to me, is that the God of the universe... The one who created all things and sustains all things and the one who has been present in fire and in water and the one who holds unimaginable power within his grasp. He chose to come to earth by way of a family. He chose to be a human son. He chose to be raised by a mother and a father. He chose to be the brother to other little boys and little girls. I mean, he, he chose to come to us in the most gentle and lowly way possible. Innocent. He could have stepped in at any point, And he could have just taken control. By force. He could have overthrown kings and halted military forces and power that was at work in our world. But he didn't. He chose family. He chose family to be the way in which he would enter the world to change the world forever. So from the very beginning, it's like in this sense that God knew in the very beginning that family would change the world. That it would build society and build culture. And then when he chooses to come and be Emmanuel, God with us, it seems as if he hasn't given up on this dream. But he still believes that we can change the world through family. And if this is what God believes about family, why don't we adopt the same belief? Why don't we adopt the same truth? Why don't we also come alongside and say, God, we can change the world through our family. Through our children and their children. And we can change the world. We can do what God's called us to do. So if God hasn't given up on family, and I don't think he has... We're not going to either. We're going to hold tightly to this idea. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure the families in our church leave a blessing to future generations. Let's pray. God, I thank you for um, just the chance that we have to be here today. And um, God, I thank you for my family. I thank you for my mom and my dad and my grandparents. I thank you that they were people of faith. I thank you that they came to church and introduced me to church and to the Bible, to songs about you and 
God, I thank you for just the blessings that they have, have given. The support and care and love and affection that they've offered. That every time that I've ever needed anything, I, I knew I could trust them. I knew I could rely on them. God, I thank you that that's my story because it's not everybody's story. And God, I just... But I also, I pray against the forces of darkness that are at work in my family. I pray against the sins of the past and of the present. I pray against those forces becoming dominant and, 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 and prevailing and, and moving its way into my children and their children. And God, I pray the same thing for everyone in the room. God, I pray that we will be people who will, who will wrestle and do the hard work of going backwards so that we can go forward. God, so that our families can be a blessing to the world, pointing them to you, showing them your love, showing them your grace, showing them what it looks like to be with you and become like you and do what you did. God, I pray, I pray that this is one of the, the legacies of this church. Is how we love families and help families make it from one generation to the next. Make it connected, loving one another, being a blessing to the world. God, change the world through the families of this church. Change the world. Change lives. God, we love you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you know, we, um, we have, um, every week at our church, we have an opportunity where we come to the table. Uh, the table to remember Jesus' body broken and his blood shed. And so there are four tables. There's two up here in the front. There are two in the back. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand and, and make your way to one of these tables. And what I want you to, what I want you to remember is I want you to remember that what this broken body and this cup represents is it represents that thousands of generations removed from the beginning of time, God's love is still coming after us. That his love and his faithfulness his forgiveness against sin and rebellion and wickedness are still alive today and have made themselves made themselves present in our life. So when we come to the table and we take the body and we take the cup, may we not forget that we could have been dealing with far worse than just some consequences but we could be dealing with the punishment of our sin. But because Jesus took our punishment, because he allowed his body to be beaten and broken and bloodied, and because he died on the cross for us, our punishment was on him. And we now have life and freedom and forgiveness. We get to see his love at work right now. So if you would stand, I'd, I'd ask you to stand, and then uh, in just a second, as I leave the stage, we're just going to move our way around the room to these tables and remember the sacrifice of Jesus. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your love, your faithfulness that is extended to thousands, thousands of generations and thousands of people, to everyone for all time. God, we love you and praise you. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You may move and take communion whenever you feel led.